Austin, thank you so much for uh, taking time to do this Q&A. Thank you again, of course, for also the, the last conversation we had about your book. And I know it's doing really well. And so congratulations on that. Thank you very much. And this person said, I believe Jesus Christ created us all and loves us all equally. That's, we're off to a good start. We're on, we're on the same page yeah, so far. All done, we're on, <laughs> maybe that's the sum total of what we have to say about this topic. No, I'm sorry. Uh, they had more to say. I would not personally encourage anyone, child or not, to go along with gender confusion. I've read stories of those who attempted suicide after gender change surgeries. Their DNA didn't change. I see it as a tool of the enemy who hates God's prized creation made in his image. I love you too, and I care enough to tell you the truth, even if you might hate me for it. So that's the uh, direct sort of quote part of it. Mm -hmm. Well, I know that, uh, you know, a fair amount of your work is working in faith communities, and this is a conversation. We're going to uh, talk in a little bit about the fact it's not the only conversation, is, but it's certainly one that gets uh, maybe a little bit more traction. Um, and so I know you're having these kinds of conversations in, we've, in these faith communities on a regular basis. H how, do you, how do you respond when you hear sort of not just that specific thing, but, but in general, um, this conflict between what does it mean to love somebody and this interpretation of scripture and what it means to be a Christian relative to other members of the faith community? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I always try to approach these conversations or, or like somebody with a question like that with curiosity. I think uh, entering into a conversation w in sort of the spirit of curiosity can really, um, it can lead to a lot more like growth and um, it can strengthen a relationship rather than just immediately saying like, I disagree and we're just going to butt heads and just sort of like both be punching against a brick wall. If you come into it with curiosity and, and ask people, you know, why do you believe these specific things and like, where, where can we um, what things can we maybe read together? What have you read that you'd like me to read? What have I read that I'd like you to read? And like, where does this come from? Um, so really coming into it with curiosity is the main thing that I always try to do. When it comes to some of the things that this specific question brought up, you know, one of them was um, that this person had read studies about negative mental health out outcomes for people that had transitioned. And while those definitely exist, they're definitely not in the majority. And you can, you can probably speak to that better than I can. Would you speak a little bit about the sort of statistics of, of people who transition? Sure. I mean, if you look just at a statistical standpoint, I mean, it, the, the data is overwhelmingly uh, clear that affirmation is, um, is the, the key issue in terms of uh, avoiding suicidality for people thinking about suicide. Uh, that's true. If they even have a single supportive adult, that person can be not only life affirming, but life saving. And mm -hmm. so we know that's true. If we look specifically at surgical data and um, the response of people that have had surgical affirmation surgery of, of some sort or another, again, the data is overwhelmingly positive uh, in terms of the mental health and wellness outcomes. There's always exceptions to every situation and those are always, and they're complex, as is everything else related to it, including the positive um, stats. So there is no one factor that determines, uh, you know, suicidality and, and what happens there. But certainly from a data perspective, what we do know is it's overwhelmingly positive who uh, folks that have an affirming surgery and, and have affirming people in their lives as they sort through these issues. Yeah. Right. And the thing that I have talked most with or pointed out most with with faith communities is that the sort of the number one predictor of a child's uh, like a, a you somebody who is younger and who is um, gender non-conforming or who is trans or non-binary the number one predictor for their well-being is having adults in their life that are supportive and apparently the number one uh, thing that determines whether parents will be supporting or not tends to be their faith background. And so like we can kind of see like as we take steps back that like if we um, really want to be supporting the youth in our lives, then the one of the best ways you can do that is by um, is by creating and supporting affirming faith communities, which is why I think this is so important. So like how do we do that? One of the ways we do that is by taking a look at, at specific beliefs that maybe have been used negatively. So this person said, for instance, like, I believe that we're all uh, created in, you know, positively and um, that God creates us a certain way for a reason. And honestly, I wouldn't dispute that. I think that's totally, uh, that's what, that's what I believe too. Um, I think maybe where the question asker and I differ is that they maybe think that the sex that somebody is assigned at birth is something that is just sort of like 
um, static and uh, and you know intentionally done in order to make somebody conform to certain gender expressions later in life. And that's the part where we differ. Because for me, as a Christian who believes that all people are created in the image of God, um, my belief is that the the me that is created encompasses all of me. It doesn't just encompass like my genitalia or like my uh, certain parts of my body uh, or the expectations people place on that body. It in incorporates my brain and how I uh, understand myself, how I understand the world. Um, and so when we think about like God creating all people, um, we can understand maybe people's gender identity as part of that creative process. Um, so that's been kind of a helpful way for me to think about it is like, um, you know, uh, Psalm 119, where it talks about, you know, we are, we are created in our mother's womb and God knew us before we were born and all this kind of language and thinking about the fact that that can encompass all of who we are. It's not just our body. It's all, it's everything about us. Yeah. I think that's such an important point. The other thing I was reminded of when I saw that point is I really do believe this person, um, that submitted the question is coming from a genuine place in their heart of love and a, a commitment as a Christian. And it reminded me of how many times in my own life also when I'm, when I encounter something I'm not familiar with. Um, I've probably heard a lot about it, but I may not, you know, I have a lot of learning to do, right? <laughs> and we're all in that, I think. And as Christians, we have a responsibility to not just be uh, like uh, sort of others that may not have a spiritual uh, component to their life. Well, I, I, I sort of feel like at least in my own faith that one of the things I'm doing, I, I'm obligated to go to the next step, to understand it, to learn. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that that's one of the things that when we look at, for many people of faith, just like everybody else, we haven't thought that much about gender. And that the things that we do know, as you just said about gender are filtered through our families, our experiences, mm -hmm. uh, where we grow up, a, a, a lot of other factors. And that one of the challenges for me, because I think there is a spiritual obligation to do more, to know more, is what do I do to talk to those people um, who can help me understand this experience differently firsthand? Mm -hmm. And not just those that reinforce my existing perspectives and beliefs, but those that have a different experience. So it seems interesting to me, for example, from a theological standpoint, of course, there's many affirming Christians that read the same scripture and read it and interpret it differently. Um, there are uh, transgender and other gender diverse Christians who have had surgery and other experiences that have a very different experience than the one that this person has heard about, which is also an experience that people have. And so how do we deal with that from a spiritual perspective, I guess, is really the question. And, and maybe it's not a question you can answer because it's really one of personal faith and what we think, but certainly um, in, in the life of Christ, what we see is, is, is Christ going to people and being with them. Yeah. Um, and, and even those that challenge the, the existing norms that uh, existed in the society that, that Christ grew up in, it was a part of. Um, and that seems like at least like one model. Uh, do you have any thoughts about the ways in which we, that it, do you believe there's a spiritual obligation as, as a Christian to, to reach out to those that, um, that, especially if we're taking a position Mm -hmm. um, about what love in action as a Christian means. Um, and I, I guess I'm just curious, uh, sort of related to that first question, what you think about that? Yeah, I mean, I definitely think there's an obligation on Christian communities always to work for the good of anybody who is um, struggling and anybody, like especially groups that are oppressed and especially groups that are um, being... Um, uh, put down in any way. I think that's definitely something we're called to do. And so, you know, for me, it always comes back to um, when it, when we're looking at things through a Christian lens and a Christian context, it comes back to Jesus saying, you know, the greatest commandment is to love God. And the second is like it to love your neighbor. Um, and so if, if we as Christians filter everything through that lens of, does this help us love God and love our neighbor? That is going to, um, that's going to determine the way that we act in the world. And it's going to determine how we support people. I think where things get lost in translation is that bit, like that's the question asker, second part of that question, which says like, I love you enough to tell you that this is wrong. You know, that like, what does loving our neighbor actually mean? What does it actually look like? Um, and I think when we get to that point, we have to take a look at 
what the effects of our theology are. Um, my friend Matthew Vines um, started this wonderful group called the Reformation Project, and I definitely recommend people check it out. Um, but it's specifically to dialogue with um, other Christians who don't believe the same things we do about like LGBT people. And um, he says that we should always look at the fruit of relationships. Um, just like Jesus says, you know, you know, a tree by its fruit. It doesn't produce good fruit. Then it's a good tree. Does it produce bad fruit? It's a bad tree. So like when we look at the fruit of what our theology is producing, is that fruit um, youth that are surviving and thriving and living into their faith? Or is it um, youth that are maybe um, being put down by their faith and that are at a greater risk for things like suicide and negative mental health outcomes. So far, that's what we've seen is that youth that grow up in non-affirming um, households and communities that are like non-affirming because of their faith, those kids tend to have a much, much harder time in life <laughs> um, for a lot of different reasons. But but it's so like when we see that, it kind of makes us think, well, maybe we should reevaluate how we um, sort of use our theology? Is it is it causing pain or is it causing um, uh, people to thrive in the world? Yeah, it's a it's a really it's a really important thing. And I appreciate the person who who submitted the question, because it's certainly each of us has to really wrestle with that in our individual faith and, and as a faith community.